welcome and to team trust inclusion. You're probably used to seeing me and other people talk virtually, but today, why not bring in the big guns, John Register, on our inclusion podcast. John, obviously you've still got the muscles. How much can you bench these days? I have no idea okay, how much it is, but I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one thing, Ryan. <laughs> you, you do know what this is, right? What? Or this right here, right? It's Maybe. my gun rack. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So today, of course, we're joined by John Register, a two-time Paralympian, one-time medalist. You brought your yeah, silver medal here. Yeah, I did. Bring here. the medal in, yeah, for of sure. Of course. Yeah. We're in the U.S. Oh, yeah, look at that thing. <laughs> We're in the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Museum here in Colorado Springs, right in front of John's running leg. I am kind of curious, John, what does it mean to you to have a running leg on display alongside the likes of Kobe Bryant and all these other top athletes? Well, look who it's right in front of. It's in front of Serena Williams' signed tennis ball and shoe because I always had a leg up on Serena. <laughs> You know, what it means is I think the in total on inclusion, we're talking about inclusion today, and inclusion is not just because we're included into the conversation, but inclusion means everything that encompasses how we belong and show up in organizations. And so what the United States Olympic and Paralympic uh, Museum has done in Olympic City, USA, here in Colorado Springs, Colorado, has really shown the integration between these two worlds of uh, disability and, and um, for the lack of a better word, able-bodied, right? Or temporarily able-bodied individuals. And so we see this come together where this is the, this experience that people have here at this museum, anybody can come through it. Yeah, yeah, so then, you know, why is it important for people to see Paralympians on the same level as Olympians? Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not sure if seeing on the same level is how I would describe it, uh, and, and here's why. I was an Olympic class athlete in, you know, trying to make the Olympic team and having the injury which caused an amputation to my left leg and then coming back and winning a medal in the Paralympic Games, you know, even though they're the same inside of sport, I see them quite differently. As Olympic class athletes, you know, we see the, the performance of gold, silver and bronze medals. We also see that on the Paralympic side, but it goes a lot broader and deeper. And here's what I mean. when. Folks came up to me after the, Olymp uh, the Paralympic Games in Sydney, Australia, with the youth or with families. The conversations were not around how I won the gold or how I won the silver medal. The conversation was, "Hey, how did you tweak your leg to get this function of performance? Who, what was your, who was your prosthetist? How did you find the prosthetist? How did you learn how to walk on that leg again?" And I found that exactly with um, some of the individuals who were wheelchair users or who were blind, visually impaired, the conversations went a lot more deeper because we all have family members that may have a disability. Yeah, so when we, we talk about sport and when I've spoken with athletes, I think we all kind of realize there's even much more to life than winning a medal or having a, a leg on display in a museum. You know, when you retired from sports, what was it like to find employment then? So you made a comment around the, the um, medals, right? Mm -hmm. and, and medals to me only represent a point in time of some type of success that we may have had. And then that moment is gone. So we have the remnants of it, right? Of the, the, the silver medal that I have. I can show it around, but that's a past performance. So I really had two uh, transitions that I, when I look at employment uh, in my life. The first one, was a forced uh, look for a job because I'm not gonna be able to do the military. I was in the United States Army when I had the, the amputation happen. So I wasn't gonna be deployable any longer. And before we had this kind of a holistic way of working with service members to get back to healthy, active lifestyles, I was kind of pushed off to the side because I was no longer a green block for the commander, which meant I was deployable into, into battle, into theater. So I just, used all the resources that were around me, the transition assistance program, and, and folks were telling me that the leaders of these, you know, the instructors were saying, go out and just try to uh, audition for a job or try to get a job you don't even want so that you can get practice and rehearse. So I went out to, you know, companies, fast food restaurants and things of, of things I really didn't want and just practiced, right, just practiced. Uh, and then that prepared me for the job that I actually did want. 
So I began working for the United States Army's uh, Community and Family Support Center, Morale, Welf Welfare and Recreation, and actually helping to run the world-class athlete program that I had once been a member of as a, as a soldier athlete. And at the same time as I was doing that, I was beginning to understand how to build programming. So I was taking the skill sets that I had learned in communications uh, as at, the, uh, at the University of Arkansas, and now I was able to put them into a consortium uh, with a lot of other groups, total arm involvement in recruiting missions, uh, in trying to get athletes to come on to the, the world-class athlete program. But Ryan, I think the second transition is moving from, you know, kind of the athletic piece, right? Because in 2000, I have my last um, sporting event, right? So I win the silver medal, but now I'm transitioning on my own from the, 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 the world-class athlete program, U.S. Army, into the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, uh, which was of my own volition. And I really didn't know if I wanted to come to work in Colorado Springs because it was going to be a, a large transition for myself and for my, and the, and my, my family. Uh, but when I got here, you know, we said, how could I actually make some impact? And the, the question became up, you know, because we the, there was the war was just about to start. Uh, it was just beginning the, the Iraq war. And uh, my boss, uh, Charlie, said, hey, what can we do for our military veterans? And I said, well, you know, really, what do you want to do? And so we began this military sport program, which turned into that. So I did a he lot of heavy lifting, which really trans um, was because of the job I had previous. So for 10 years, I was actually building programs for better opportunity for single soldiers programs uh, in uh, around the United States and around the, the world with, uh, with the military. So I was able to make all these relationships. And so I had all these relationships with Walter Reed at Brooklyn Medical Center uh, in San Diego. So I knew all of these commanders that were there and it was very easy to, to try to put a sports program there. It was very difficult for the attitudinal barriers or what we now call ableism that was starting to uh, rear its, its kind of ugly head up. When you're starting to get work, and then when we talk about kind of the global perspective and employing individuals with disabilities, you know, why is that something we need to continue to push for? Why do we need to continue getting persons with disabilities into the workforce? I think the reason it's really important to get people with disabilities into the workplace <clears throat> is because we, we're missing talent. Uh, and that's really the, the, bottom, the bottom line for me. We see that we have of the world population, you know, 15, you know, uh, percent of the world's population has a disability. It's like 1.2 billion people, and that really equates to when you when you talk about um, the masses of dollars, about seven trillion dollars of money, discretionary income that we're not paying attention to. <clears throat> so I think it's really important for you know society to understand that if you really want your business to in increase put people with disabilities, hire, promote, not because it's a nice thing to do, but because it's a revenue generator. It, it adds to the bottom line. Accenture did a report, I think it was Q4 of 2018, their report came out on getting, um, uh, getting to equal, uh, the Disability Equality um, Index, which is run by the Disability Inn and uh, American Association for People with Disabilities. And what the report found was that when you take two like companies, one that had the DEI, the Disability Equality Index, and another one that kind of did not, we saw that um, company A actually outperformed company B two to one to shareholder returns. And so that caused the comptroller of New York State, Mr. Tom DiNapoli, to say not in Washington, D.C., but on the New York Stock Exchange with Voya that was there and Accenture and all these big powerhouses to say, I have a trillion dollars in pension funds and I'm, I'm going to begin to invest in company A's and not company B's based upon the, the return on investment that I can get to grow the pension fund. And you could have heard a pin drop in the room. People were shifting, trying to figure out how do I get on board with that? And now we see at least 80 executive CEOs of these Fortune 250 companies have signed on to make a commitment to disability equity and inclusion, uh, instead of diversity, equity, inclusion. Just you see how I did that there? Disability, equity, inclusion. Um, and what's all comes really down to belonging. My company can advance uh, because of, of, of that hire. Yeah, so you're saying I could make more money 
if I hire somebody with a disability then? Absolutely, because people with disabilities, they, they show, they're more present uh, for the job. Uh, they take less sick days. Uh, the, the average um, accommodation for a person with a disability is about $500, $600. Not, so there's all these misconceptions that are out there that we do. So when people ask me, well, where do we find them, John? Them, right? Uh, and I say, well, if you don't have the talent to find people with disabilities, you probably have the wrong people on your team, right? So we got to change those questions. There, people with disabilities are going to school. I mean, we have a whole group of uh, Paralympic athletes that are camping out at, at University of Illinois, camping out at University of uh, Alabama and all these other big schools that they, they say, which of course they're not with inside the NCAA, right? We haven't, we haven't aligned them with the NCAA yet, so they are kind of an affiliate group of the organization. Here's your t-shirt that you can use, which is what was done to us in 2000. So the 2000 uniform that I wore was the hand-me-downs from the, the 1996 games in Atlanta. So when we look at this, we can see, we can see that there's, there's ways that we can elevate and we can get this bar uh, elevated. So absolutely, the hiring of people with disabilities does increase your bottom line. Very interesting. You mentioned the University of Illinois. That's where I went to school. And I do believe I saw athletes camping outside their uh, training <laughs> center every now and then. Um, but you know, when you're talking about you know, individuals with disabilities bringing more revenue, do you think for Paralympians, they come with a collection of skill sets that they learn from sport that they can then transfer to a, any sort of business? Yeah, I, that's a great, interesting question because um, I've always believed that sports is a conduit to other things, disability or not dis disability. We see with the global sport mentoring program that the United, uh, our, our, our State Department runs, or we talk about uh, sports envoy programs, which uh, I helped to push uh, with Secretary Clinton at the time uh, to have people with disabilities, athletes with disabilities, to be on those sports envoy programs. Because when we show up, if you're showing up in your chair or somebody's showing up as visually impaired um, or any other type of disability that's, that's kind of where access is, isn't gained because of a, a ramp or step or something like that, it quickly draws out that this high official that we have coming in to represent, we can't get them around our country. And it almost becomes almost an embarrassment because of it. But we also can learn from those individuals because they want to do what is proper so that they can actually add to their bottom line. And we can see in the United States how far we have to go. For example, we, when you look at 1990 and the ADA law coming into, uh, it's signed by George H.W. Bush, we see the, the cutouts and the ramps and the, the access to transportation. Uh, but what we don't see is the, the ableism go down, right? We don't, what we don't see is the attitudinal barrier that I, that I um, have against the person with a disability. And that's why employment hasn't moved from 71.5% down to, what, 71%, right? It it's, hasn't moved hardly at all. And why is that? Why, when Ted Kennedy Jr. says that employment is the next frontier, it's always been the frontier. How, how, have, how are we um, showing up? And how are we opening access to people? And, or how are we blocking them? We just had a whole transition from our, um, in our society. When people with disabilities were coming to the workplace, they were saying, hey, you know what, I can work from home. You know, I don't really need accommodation there. I can just do it from here. No, 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 we want you part of the team. Come, we want you, we need you in the office. And then we had a pandemic hit and everyone went home. And we're finding out that we're actually more productive at home than we were in the office in, in many cases, which is causing people that want to bring their employees back in the office to have a, the, the, the great um, resignation happening, because I don't want to go back in the office, right? For whatever reason that might be. And these, these things begin to happen uh, around our society. But people with disabilities have been dealing with the ad adaptation so fast. They've been saying, I can work from home. Now they're saying that, we're seeing that. I can work from an office, we're seeing that as well. The same, the same is true. We, we, just, we just show up and actually can just do the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of my last question for today, although we could talk all day, I'm Absolutely. sure. Um, you know, for people who aren't familiar, what is ableism? Ableism is anything that will prohibit somebody with a disability from having equal opportunity, equal access to what normally would be 
for somebody else. Uh, so if there's a job opportunity that's there, why don't I think about the person with a disability to bring them into the fold uh, to a physical uh, a barrier that it's, it's obviously that you're not limited by your intellect. You're limited by if there's not a, if there's not a curb cut out there, you can't have access to uh, whatever structure that you're trying to get into. So we talk about universal design as, the, as switching that, uh, kind of code switching that, so that everybody has access. And so with, with ableism, we wanna make sure that we are advocating for people with disabilities and making sure everything is on an equal playing field. So don't come to us afterward to build out your, your ramps or open your rooms up in your hotels after you already built the whole thing, right? Just make every room accessible. And you, you, can make, you can make accessible rooms brilliantly, right? Because we, we have seen uh, models out there of, of just, it doesn't even matter. This whole museum is like that, that where it, it doesn't, you won't even realize that it's, it's made for people with disabilities because it's just seamless into the artwork and to everything, all the exhibits that we see. And, and instead of going, you know, wheeling up from the bottom and spiraling up, we can spiral down in this building to go see all the exhibits, uh, starting at the top with elevators and all these things that, that, that happen here. I think where we pick up ableism is, and, and it's a yes and, we, we pick it up from what we have been taught uh, uh, because others hadn't known, so we just kind of pass it from one to the other. And we do it just as a society in general. So it's other people and a society that's been dictating. Why is it when we look at horror films, all the, all the villains have a dis, some type of dis, disfigurement or disability. We see that for most of the time. So does that reflect back on myself? You know, Captain Hook, he was an amputee, got his arm bit off by TikTok, the crocodile, he wears a hook for a claw, uh, he's dark, he's mysterious, I'm scared of him, he's scaring the Lost Boys in the movie Peter Pan. Wait a minute, I'm an amputee. Am I the one that's dark, mysterious, and scary now? And we see this all the time, burn victims that were for our, we say thank you for your service, you know, to our, to our veteran population, but when we talk about the, the burn victims who are down at, at Brook Army Medical Center and over 90% of their bodies, now do we, when they get home and they turn on the, the, the movie, watch with their family and they see Nightmare on Elm Street, are they the Freddy Kruegers that are to scare kids in their, their children's dreams? So that's what we have to look at and fight against when we're talking about ableism and bringing people uh, together. Well, that got scary quick. <laughs> um, but I really appreciate your time, John. It's been nice talking with you and I really appreciate all our camera people here for setting us up. Absolutely. Dane Smith sitting there. What are you doing again? <laughs> oh, um, he's doing he's, something. He's trucking the camera. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's right. Um, really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, this has been another episode of Team Trust Inclusion and stay tuned for more. <laughs>